Melina Lipinska from Poland. Are you Polish? From which? What is your village? Have you heard of so, the Vienna is going to talk to us about the adverse outcome of Twitter, as it's according to Korean Yeah. Good afternoon. I will be presenting a series of studies on the outcome of twin pregnancies. And I will be specifically focusing on fetal death before 24 weeks, neonatal death after 24 weeks, preterm birth before 32 weeks, and birth of small for gestational age babies below the fifth centile. And then I will be examining the relationship between these outcomes and chorionicity and amnionicity, discordance in fetal crown ramp length between the two babies, and the high nuclear translucency in one or both of the twins. The story in many respects began in the early 1990s with the realization that at the time of the 11 to 13 week scan, we can distinguish between the monochorionic and dichorionic twins. And this was reported by Professor Sepulveda, who was a research fellow of Professor Nicolaitis. Subsequently, Neil Sibir, who presented fantastic lectures in this meeting, he examined 456 twins at 10 to 13 weeks and showed that in monochorionic twins, the risk of death, especially before 20 weeks, was much, much higher in monochorionic twins than in dichorionic twins. Just want to remind you that until that time, most of the ultrasound scans were done at around 20 weeks. And these women were miscarrying and nobody knew why they miscarried. So that's how they labeled their paper. The previously unrecognized high rate of early mortality of monochorionic twins is likely to be the consequence of underlying twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. And they suggested that the only way to reduce this mortality is to identify these pregnancies in the first trimester, follow them up, and identify the earliest stage as possible at which they develop twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome and then treat them with endoscopic laser surgery that this team had developed in 1992. Again, Professor Liu was a research fellow of Professor Nicolaitis. Recently, we have been able to look at more than 6,000 twin pregnancies assessed at 12 weeks, where the criterion was that they were both alive at the 11 to 13 weeks scan. And about 80% were dichorionic, 20% were monochorionic, and about 1% were monoamniotic. And you can see that the results are confirming those of an earlier era. These are the survival graphs. If we take singleton pregnancies, the risk of death before 24 weeks is about 1%. And the risk of death, prenatal death after 24 weeks, in England is about 0.4%. The rate of preterm birth is 2%. And the risk of a small baby, one or both babies, is about 5%. We can see that in dichorionic twins, the risk of death before or after 24 weeks is more or less twice as much. For preterm birth is 7%, and the birth weight is below the fifth centile in about 30% of the babies. In monochorionic twins, we have a much higher rate of early fetal loss, especially before 24 weeks, and much more so in monoamniotic twins. Next question is, can we predict these adverse events in the first trimester on the basis of the findings of the CRL measurement? Well, these are categories of the CRL discordance, less than 5% and more than 20%. And you can see that there is no significant difference between the three types of twins. The distribution is very similar. But I just want to highlight that the CRL discordance of more than 10% is found in only 8% of the population more than 15% in only 2% of the population, and more than 20% in only 0.6% of all the population. I will come back to that later on. 
The first question was how useful is the serial discordance in the prediction of one of each adverse outcomes that I described. And these are rock curves. You can see the blue ones are for dichorionic, the red ones are for monochorionic. There is some relationship, but the areas under the curves are quite shallow. So the predictive performance of the serial discordance is quite poor, it's not very good. However, if we now focus on early fetal loss, a completely different picture emerges. If we now look at the loss in dichorionic genes, let's say before 20 weeks, then for those that had a discordance of less than 10%, the risk of fetal loss is 1%. Whereas in those with the discordance of more than 10%, uh -huh. the risk of fetal loss is 2%. And for those with the discordance of more than 15%, okay. the small group is 5%. So it's five times more. The same is true for monochorionic twins. For those that had a discordance of less than 10%, the risk is 9%. Whereas for those with a discordance of more than 10%, the risk is 33%. And it increases to 70% in those with the discordance of more than 20%. Now, what are the implications of that? In a very, very small subgroup, although the overall performance of the screening by discordance is not great, in a small subgroup with a very high discordance, there is a very, very high risk of fetal loss. And in a case of dichorionic twins, we should be seeing those back after the 12 week scan at around 16 weeks, because maybe we miss certain abnormalities that would contribute to the fetal loss. And secondly, we would be able to first of all reassure the vast majority with the very big discordance that both babies are growing well, but in a few that are evolving into severe selective IUGR, we can follow them up more closely and inform the parents that that baby may be at risk of death. In the case of monochorionic twins, again, the proportion is very, very small, but the risk is so dramatically increased. The policy for monochorionic twins is to see them again at 16 weeks, but we think in those with the very high discordance, we should be seeing them even at 14 weeks to see whether we are heading for a severe selective IUGR or severe twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome that would cause the death of the babies even before 16 weeks. Now, what should we do in those that it looks as if there is a severe selective IUGR at this stage? Well, one of the options is to do laser, knowing that if we do laser, we have a much higher risk of causing fetal loss, but it's worth trying if they are dying anyway. I will now look at the high nuca. Well, again, first studies in the early 90s were that the prevalence of the high nuchal translucency is much higher in monochorionic twins than in dichorionic twins. And within monochorionic, twi and, and within monochorionic twins, the higher nuchal was predictive of subsequent development of twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And then, once you've got a bigger number of cases, High NT was predictive of development of twin to twin transfusion syndrome or fetal loss before 18 weeks. So, this is the background. Here we have the results. It is true that the incidence of high NT is much higher in monochorionic than in dichorionic twins. Again, survival graphs. In dichorionic twins, there was no significant difference in the rate of death in those with the nuchal below compared with those with the nuchal above. Mm -hmm. Whereas in monochorionic twins, there was no relationship between the nuchal and the rate of death after 20 weeks, but before 20 weeks, in those that had a nuchal above 95th centile, there was a much higher risk of early fetal loss. In summary, the incidence of pregnancy complications is much higher in monochorionic and more so in monoamniotic than in dichorionic twins and singletons. The risk of fetal loss before 24 weeks in monochorionic twins or the need for laser is much higher in those with the big discrepancy than in those with the smaller discrepancy. And the incidence of high NT, again, is much higher in those with the 
loss or need for laser before 20 weeks. Thank you.